Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning. As we proceed to prepare to go through this document that is now before us and continue in the discussions that we had this last week and that that we've had for several weeks, shall we ask for our Heavenly Father to guide us and show us that which we need to understand And for that, where we need to give attention within our lives so that we may truly surrender to him. Shall we ask for his guidance now in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we ask for your direction and for your guidance. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you have been providing. We thank you for your watch care and for your direction. We ask, Father, for your forgiveness of our sins, that you will continue to help to prepare us for the outpouring of your spirit, I thank you, Father, for each one that is joining us here today, for those that will join later, that will watch this as it is recorded. We ask now, Father, for angels to attend us. We ask for your blessing at this time, that our minds may be open to be prepared for that which you would have us to do. May this be your spirit, Father, that goes forward, not my spirit. Help us each one now. For this, Father, we thank you and we ask you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we as we look at this document, the title of it was the reception of the Holy Spirit for the week of prayer reading for December of 1903. So this was being given 120 years ago. This manuscript was not initially published in the United States. It was published in the Australian Union Recorder. June 1st of 1904, or it may have been the 6th of January of 1904. But at this point, Christ's commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, is spoken to every one of his followers. We find this in Mark 16, 15. All who are ordained into the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. Their hearts will throb in unison with the heart of Christ. The same longing of soul that he felt will be manifest in them. Not all can fill the same place in the work, but there is a place and a work for all. Upon all upon whom God's blessing has been bestowed, are to respond by actual service. Every gift is to be employed for the advancement of his kingdom and the glory of his name. Does that mean that only ordained pastors or compensated conference workers are to give the gospel? The gospel is so complex that there is much that can be addressed. We have many that are yet to be reached and many ways in which this is to go forward. In every part of the world, the message is to be proclaimed in the power of the Spirit. Not with tame, lifeless utterance is it to be given, but with clear, decided, stirring tones. Hundreds are waiting for the warning to escape for their lives and lay hold on the hope set before them in the gospel. 
what warning is to yet be given? Is this warning not the three angels' message? It is. Okay. The world needs to see in Christians an evidence of the power of Christianity. There should be many more at work at the Lord's service, clothed with holy zeal, filled with a power proportionate to the performance of the message they proclaim, not merely in a few places, but throughout the world. Messengers of mercy are needed. From every country is heard the cry, come over and help us, Acts 16.9. Rich and poor are calling for light. Thousands of men and women are are standing on the brink of perdition. Do you see them? Many of them lost, eternally lost, while professing Christians sleep the sleep of indifference. This week it was interesting because one morning as I spoke with Jennifer, she came to the Hayden Church. And there was a man dressed primarily in summer clothes that was asleep on the lawn of the church. He was waiting for community service people to open the doors. How are we to reach people? How can we reach those that know little of Scripture and how little they know of the danger that is before us? God does not ask us to do in our own strength the work that is before us. He has provided divine assistance for all emergencies to which our human resources are unequal. He gives the Holy Spirit to help in every strait to strengthen our hope and assurance to illuminate our minds and purify our hearts. What kind of a promise is this? If he's giving us the Holy Spirit, Should we not be prepared to accept it? Just before his crucifixion, the Savior said to his disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. John 14, 18 and 16. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John sixteen thirteen. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John fourteen twenty six. Christ has promised to guide, to comfort, and sustain his people. He declares, I will be with you in your work of persuading men and women to be my disciples. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have pledged themselves to aid you in your unselfish efforts to turn men from unrighteousness to righteousness, from darkness to the light of truth. Consider this statement for a moment. How many times are we finding people today that are saying to us within the Adventist church that there is no Holy Spirit? Yet what does this sentence say to us right now? Is it not saying that the Godhead, the three personalities, are joined together and have pledged themselves to aid in the unselfish efforts to save the world. It is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of his grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured 
the holy oil to be a joy and a blessing to human hearts. What is Christ waiting for here? Does this statement not make sense with what we have been studying these last several weeks? Christ has made provision that his church shall be a transformed body, illuminated with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. Possessing the glory of God with us. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and of peace. There is no limit to the usefulness of the one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. The indwelling of the Spirit will be shown by the outflowing of heavenly love. The divine fullness will flow through the consecrated human agent to be given forth to others. What was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? The glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost parts of the inhabited world. The hearts of the disciples were surcharged with a benevolence so full, so deep, so far-reaching that it impelled them to go to the ends of the earth, testifying, God forbid that we should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. As they proclaimed the truth as it is in Jesus, hearts yielded to the power of the message. The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Believers were reconverted, sinners united with Christians in seeking the pearl of great price. Those who had been the bitterest opponents of the gospel became its champions. Name one, name one who had been the bitterest opponent of the gospel and became its champions. Paul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. The prophecy was fulfilled. The weak shall be as David, and the house of David as the angel of the Lord. Zechariah 12.8 Every Christian saw in his brother the same similitude of love and benevolence. One interest prevailed. One subject of emulation swallowed up all the others. The only ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. And, of course, the disciples made the decision to cast others out that didn't believe like them, right? One subject, one heart, one purpose. How can we be one when there are those that choose that they would rather fight. With great power came the apostles, gave the apostles witness, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Acts 4.33. Under their labors, there were added to the church chosen men who, receiving the word of life, consecrated their lives to the work of giving to others the hope that had fulfilled their hearts with peace and with joy. Hundreds proclaim the message, the kingdom of God is at hand. They could not be restrained or intimidated by threatenings. The Lord spoke through them, and wherever they went, the sick were healed and the poor had the gospel preached unto them. So mightily can God work when men give themselves up to the control of his spirit. What does this say of us today? This one statement, this one sentence, paragraph 11 of this manuscript. Are we giving ourselves up to the control of his spirit? Are we willing to work mightily for God? But are we seeking to do it in our own way? Or are we willing to be controlled by the Spirit? 
to us today as verily as to the first disciples, the promise of the Spirit belongs. God will today endow men and women with power from above as he endowed those who on the day of Pentecost heard the message of salvation. At this very hour, his spirit and his grace are for all who need them and who will take him at his word. Brothers and sisters, are we taking God at his word today? Are we becoming unified to be able to go forward as God would have us to do? Notice that it was after the disciples had come into perfect unity, when they were no longer striving for the highest place that the Spirit was poured out. These are not my words. These are not my statements. This is from the pen of inspiration. They were of one accord. All differences have been put away. And the testimony born of them after the Spirit had been given is the same. Mark the word. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Acts 4.32 The Spirit of him who died that sinners might live animated the entire company of believers. Brothers and sisters, After the crucifixion, how many days did the disciples have with the Savior before he again returned to heaven? Are you talking about the 40 days? Yes, I am. After Christ ascended, how many days was it? For the disciples to come into one accord. It was 10 days, wasn't it? It was nine days, and on the 10th, what happened? Pentecost. The Spirit was poured out. Right? Right. Now, why is it that we have this example? We have this being shown to us. That God is willing to give his great gifts, the Savior and the outpouring of the Spirit. And within 10 days, the disciples came into one accord. What's wrong with us today? Why are we so unwilling to receive this gift? The disciples did not ask for a blessing for themselves. They were weighted with the burden of souls. The gospel was to be carried to the ends of the earth, and they claimed the endowment of the power that Christ had promised. It was, then it was that the Holy Spirit was poured out, and thousands converted in a day. Have we claimed this same endowment? Have we shown that we're willing to be purified vessels for this outpouring of the Spirit? So it may be now. Let Christians put away all dissension and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. Let them ask in faith for the promised blessing, for it will come. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former reign, and glorious was the result. We see this from Hosea 6, verse 3. But the latter rain will be more more abundant. What is the promise to those living in these last days? Turn ye to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do as I declare that I will render double unto thee. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So shall the Lord make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Zechariah 9, verse 12, and 10, verse 1. Christ declared that the divine influence of the Spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. 
but the promise is not appreciated as it should be. And therefore, its fulfillment is not seen as it might be. What does this say of us today? What are your thoughts? Are we appreciative of the promise for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to be refined, to be purified, made white and tried? The promise of the Spirit is a matter little thought of. And the result is what might be expected. Spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, and death. Minor matters occupy the attention and the divine power that is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in its infinite plenitude. How, be, how else can we re, respond to this? How can we examine this statement? What minor matters are occupying the attention? There's attitude that we are seeing all the way through. As I've said in the past, I cannot point one finger without three pointed at myself. So if there are minor matters between myself and a brother or myself and a sister, may they be resolved. The divine power, the golden oil is waiting to be poured out. But the golden oil can only be poured out into vessels that have been refined that have no spot and no wrinkle and no dross in them. It is the absence of the spirit which makes the gospel ministry so powerless. Learning, talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed, but without the presence of the spirit of God, no heart will be touched. No sinner will be won to Christ. On the one hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and the most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them a channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. Do we make ourselves this channel? Or does God make us into this channel? What does this statement say to you? Why do we not hunger and thirst for the gifts of the Spirit? Since this is the means by which we are to receive power. Why do we not talk of it? Pray for it. Preach concerning it. The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to us than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the baptism of the Spirit, every worker should be offering his prayer to God. Companies should be gathered together to ask for special help, for heavenly wisdom, that they may know how to plan and execute wisely. Especially should men pray that God will baptize his missionaries with his Spirit. The angel of the covenant is empowering his servants to be his witnesses, to carry the truth to all parts of the world. He has sent forth his angels with their message. But as if these angels did not speed on their way fast enough to satisfy his heart of yearning love, he gives to John personally a message to be given to all. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst say, Come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. 
Revelation 22:17. He has opened a fountain for Judah and for Jerusalem. And every member of his church is to show his loyalty by inviting the thirsty to drink of the water of life. A chain of living witnesses is to carry the invitation to the world. Are we fulfilling the commission that is given us? Have we placed ourselves where God can give us the power that he gave the disciples? Power that enabled them to preach the gospel so mightily that thousands were converted in a day. How can we expect the approval of heaven while our while we leave our fellow beings unwarned? We need to humble ourselves before God because our efforts fall so short of the efforts he desires us to put forth. The privileges that he has given us, the advantages that he has bestowed, the promises that he has made should inspire us with far greater zeal and devotion. Our people in the home field have not felt as they should the responsibility of working for their neighbors. They have not prayerfully taken up the work lying before them. Earnest, sanctified efforts have not been put forth for those in America who are unenlightened. In this field, there are many unworked cities, many places that should be made centers of truth. <clears throat> Zeal for God moved the disciples to bear witness to the truth with mighty power. Should not this zeal fire our hearts with the determination to tell the story of redeeming love of Christ and him crucified? Is not the spirit of God to come today in answer to earnest, persevering prayer and fill men with power for service? Why then is the church so weak, so spiritless? Ye people of the living God, study the promises of his word and think how your lack of faith, your lack of, <clears throat> of spirituality, of divine power is hindering the coming of the kingdom of God. If you were to go forth to do Christ's work, angels of heaven would go before you, <clears throat> preparing hearts to receive the gospel. Were every one of you a living missionary, the message for this time would speedily be proclaimed in all countries to every people and nation and tongue. This is the work that must be done before Christ can come in power and great glory. Are you individually workers together with God? If not, why not? It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory. How quickly the world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So, from this type of analogy, from this statement, we're all who profess to bear his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the world would be sown. Does this not tell us that the seed of the gospel has yet to be sown in the world? Because only... After the seed is sown, do the rains come to bring the harvest, right? Can the harvest come from a field that is not planted, sown with grain? My brothers and sisters, plead for the Holy Spirit. God stands back of every promise that he has made. With your Bibles in your hands, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 
7, verse 7. Christ declares, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Mark 11, 24. Whatever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 13. The rainbow above the throne is an assurance that God is true and that in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have sinned against him and are undeserving of his favor. He himself has put into our lips that most wonderful of pleas, do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, Break not thy covenant with us. Jeremiah 14, 21. He has pledged himself to give heed to our cry when we come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word to us. Since this was given 120 years ago, since these statements were made by the pen of inspiration, how far have we progressed in giving the gospel to the world? Has this message gone forward with the power that God would endure it with? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, we studied this a little bit um last night dealing with uh, the fact that in 1888 the message obviously was not really received because the power that should have attended its proclamation didn't occur. Right. We didn't not cry. And uh, of course the church has not been proclaiming that message. So this movement is supposed to proclaim the three angels' messages. We always make that profession. But these messages are little understood. And, um, you know, the work that we're doing right now in studying and, and, uh, and sharing what we can is part of that work. But it will, at some point, uh, expand. We just don't know when or how. But we still have to do the work that we do, the little work that's before us. Right. Now, briefly, we're going to return to a part of this document that, that we've looked at in the past. I'm going to ask some questions because we've covered quite a bit of this. It'll just take me a moment to get there. Now, in all of this, the message that was given in 1888 has not fully gone first to the church or to the world. Do we agree with that? Yes, it has not yet. Okay. Now, October 2nd, 1898, letter 76 of 1898, which, if we look at this, was provided on the 16th day of the seventh month of the biblical year of 5943. Is there anything important for us to recognize about this day in the biblical timeline? This day would come after the Feast of Trumpets, right? Yes. This day would come after the Day of Atonement. Right? Right. Would this not come about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles? Right, again. Right, exactly. Yeah? Second, second day. So, what's the importance of the Feast of Tabernacles? Is it so, not... So, the, excuse yeah, me? It symbolizes the time that we're in heaven with Christ... But the harvest is done, right? Right. We are not at the point yet where the harvest is done. 
The document we just finished reading shows us that we haven't even finished the planting. With his own blood, Jesus appears in the presence of God as an intercessor for all who call upon his name. This statement is being made prior to Daniel 12.1, right? Because by the time we come to Daniel 12.1, Hasn't the intercessory ministry of Christ finished? Yes, which simply means that that time probation has uh, now closed. Right. So while the time of probation is yet open, we yet have an advocate on behalf of the guilty. While this time of probation is before us, his blood cleanses from all sin those who will accept him as their personal savior. The memorial of his sufferings and death upon the cross, the penalty due to the transgressor, is efficacious for all who believe that this propitiation in the presence of God is a perpetual offering. Christ claims that the provision made entitles him to make the assurance to all who seek him. For his sake, the prayers of the penitent who come to him acknowledging Christ as their Savior should be accepted as yea and amen, their sins blotted out, and the holy oil bestowed upon them. Here again, we come back to this portion of Zechariah 4. Then I answered and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be those two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, Knowest thou not where the, what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Here the messengers of God are represented by the olive branches which through the golden pipe empty the golden oil out of themselves. This is the heavenly vital communication from God to every soul who is emptied of self. The heavenly oil communicated to the human agent is to be given to those who are consecrated channels to flow forth from them to others. Can this heavenly communication flow through unconsecrated channels can this communication come through those that are not pure in heart and spirit no it can't sir it can't the pipes uh, have to be open <laughs> exactly for the gold oil to come out a lot of our pipes are clogged different things agreed very much agreed brother i was given a message to bear and it was this that if those before me would prepare the way for god to work by humbling their hearts before him and confessing their sins and their errors if they would empty their hearts of everything that was not in harmony with the principles of the truth the lord would commission the two olive branches to empty through the two golden pipes the golden oil out of themselves into the vessels of hearts prepared for them. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. When we take God at his word, when we believe on Christ without doubting, we shall see his Holy Spirit working upon human hearts. But when there are contentions, contentions and divisions, when those who claim to believe the truth educate their powers of criticism, the Lord cannot work through them to his own name's glory. The web is composed of so largely of human threads 
that the fabric is marred and spoiled. Consider this, brothers and sisters, as we go through this day. Are we looking to weave our own threads into the work of God? Or are we choosing to let God's garment be upon us? Here this document is, written and provided 10 years after 1888. Again, Mrs. White is stating what has not been, what has not happened. She is showing that the church at that time was not believing on Christ without doubting. They were doubting the very message that had been sent. The church was choosing not to enter into the covenant relationship with Christ because they chose to doubt that the message that was given through Jones and Wagner was of God at all. When they were doubting, what were they doing? What, sh what should they have been doing at that time? I'll be studying it out and analyzing things instead of just throwing your, you know, hands up. And... Agreed. But what should they have been studying? Well, the topic at hand, you know, which is by faith, should have been studying that. Should they not instead. have been studying God's word? Yeah. If we're studying God's word and we're taking him at his word, do we not then have the ability to believe on Christ without doubting anything? Yes. Okay. We do not manifest the consecration that we should. We have not learned the lesson of humility and meekness which is essential for us to learn. We are still on the losing side. Those who will teach the truth, as well as those who receive it, have yet to learn the most difficult lesson given to man to learn. They must learn the nothingness of human wisdom. What is to be said with this? What does this message do? Does it not humble the pride of man into the dust? Yes, it does. How hard is that to accept? Well, I think it gets in the way is us. Agreed. How are we to manifest consecration? Are we not to do this by taking on the yoke of Christ? Is this not how we learn the lesson of humility and meekness? There have been many things that we have been addressing. Many points that we're trying to, to wrestle with so that they become clear for us. As we go forward through the rest of this day, May our prayer be for the consecration that is needed so that we are then able to take God directly at his word so that we may become the purified channels, the golden bowl, in order to give the proper message to the world at this time. Do you have any other comments or questions with what we have covered today? Do you have any other thoughts? I mean, to your last statement that you have seen. Would you repeat that, please, brother? That I mean, to your last statement that, that you said. Okay. 
All right. So shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these admonitions that have been provided for us for this time. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come together to be blessed of the words of your prophet. Direct us now, Father, as we go forward. Help us and prepare us for the message that we are to receive. Guide us so that we may become consecrated, so that we may learn more of you, that we may understand what it means to accept your yoke and not ours. Direct us this day. Be with us, we ask. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.